All right, let's take a look at Beyond Bohr, the quantum mechanical model of the atom. And I'm going to come straight down here to particles behaving like waves. Uh, Niels Bohr had his theory, his theory establishing the concept of fixed atomic energy levels. And if we applied this to the line spectra of various atoms, um, especially the ones that have more than one electron, it didn't work. So Bohr knew that the energy levels had to be there, but he didn't know why. And quantum mechanics had its beginnings in 1923. And Louis de Broglie said that if waves behaved like particles, could it also be possible that particles had wave properties? And so what he did was he suggested a reason for all of the electrons fixed energy levels. And if we take a look at the next section called wave behavior. Um, here, if we think of a string as having a length L and it is fixed at both ends, kind of like a guitar string would be. Um, if you pluck that string, then it's going to oscillate in waves. And um, there are only certain frequencies and wavelengths that are possible for that wave to be maintained. And a stable wave has to have a wavelength that's a whole number. Um, and that whole number um, has to fit, or half of the wavelengths have to fit within the length of the string L. You can't have any fractional wavelengths because if you have fractional wavelengths, what happens is the waves are going to break down. So let's go to the next page here and take a look at what I'm talking about. So here is your guitar string of length L, and if you pluck it, you are going to end up having these um, whole number um, wavelengths. And you'll see how they fit perfectly if I take that um, guitar string and I put it into a circle. You'll see that the whole number wavelengths fit fine within that length L. But if I have a fractional number of wavelengths, they do not. So imagine that. Um, if this string fit into a circle that represents an electron wave or an electron orbit, de Broglie was proposing that a stable electron orbit was one whose size and energy was um, specific so that it, you could have an allowed standing electron wave and that it could be maintained. So if we take a look at his equation, here. You will see that it says that de Broglie derived an equation to calculate the wavelength of a particle, and he combined two famous equations, Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, and Planck's equation, E equals hv. And if we go to the next page here, you will see that we have this equation here. Wavelength equals Planck's constant h divided by m times v. Okay, now what is this telling us? So this is an important equation for several reasons. What this is telling us is that any moving particle, whether it's an electron or whether it's a baseball, has a wavelength that we can calculate because lambda is wavelength it equals Planck's constant divided by the mass of the particle times its velocity, okay? Now, second, it shows us that a particle's wavelength is inversely related to its mass. So what this means is if the mass of a particle decreases, its wavelength increases and vice versa. Now, any particle that's big enough for us to see is going to have a wavelength that's so ridiculously small we can't even measure it. And particles that are as small as an electron would have wavelengths that are very, very, very significant. So significant that we can't ignore them. Now, 
Let's take a look at calculating wavelengths here. All right, now, if we have a baseball, and that baseball has a mass of 0 0.120 kilograms, and I put that mass into this equation, I'm going to end up with a wavelength that is 1.24 times 10 to the negative 34th meters. So the baseball's wavelength is far smaller than the baseball. In fact, it's 10 to the 24th times smaller than the smallest atom. So there is no instrument that could be used to measure a wavelength this small. So a baseball's particle nature is basically all there is to consider when I'm talking about a baseball or a particle of that size. Okay? What if I'm talking about an electron? If I'm talking about an electron with a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the negative 30 versed kilograms, and I put that mass into my equation, I'm going to end up getting a wavelength that is 3.3 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. Is it a small wavelength? Sure. But it's 1.5 times larger than the hydrogen atom itself. Therefore, it represents a significant aspect of the nature of an electron. So let's talk about particle wave duality. The distinction between particles, there we go, the distinction between particles and waves doesn't exist in that tiny of a realm. And in the macroscopic world where we're looking at large objects, you have either a particle or a wave. But in the quantum world, meaning in the world where we are dealing with infinitely small things, um, particles and waves are the same thing. And in 1929, Louis de Broglie won the Nobel Prize in physics um, for everything that he had proposed. And let's take a look at the quick check here, where it says, what important concept concerning atomic structure was Bohr's theory responsible for? Well, he explained the emission line spectra. He said that electrons in atoms are quantized. Quantized means they exist in distinct energy levels or distinct levels. Number two, why did Bohr's atomic model need to be replaced? Because it only worked for hydrogen. It didn't work for anything else. Number three, if particles have a wave nature, why can't we detect that behavior in the big macroscopic world? That's because large particles have wavelengths that are so small that we can't even measure them, therefore we don't even consider them significant in terms of um, a property of macroscopic uh, particles. Now, we can use de Broglie's equation to calculate wavelength or mass whatever variable it is that we are looking for. If you take a look here at the practice problems, let's take a look at number one. It says calculate the de Broglie wavelength of an alpha particle having an, uh, a mass of 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms traveling at 16,000 kilometers per second. Okay, now 
If we want to calculate the wavelength, wavelength equals Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity. Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th kilograms times meter squared over second squared. That means that your mass has to be in kilograms to cancel the unit, which ours is. So 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms times your velocity needs to be in meters per second, so it cancels with the units in Planck's constant. So this has to be converted to meters per second. So in order to do that, um, that is a one-step metric conversion. You're going to get 16 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which I know is in proper scientific notation. 1.6 times 10 to the 7th would be proper scientific notation. Um, so we should probably put that, but I'm going to leave it. You're going to end up with 6.2 times 10 to the negative fifth meters for your result. Okay? Now, number two, calculate how small the mass of a particle traveling at 16,000 kilometers per second would have to be to have a wavelength equal to that of green light, which is approximately 486 nanometers. Remember to change kilometers per second to meters per second and nanometers to meters. Note that the mass you calculate will be in kilograms. So let's convert our 486 nanometers to meters in a one-step metric conversion. So 4.86 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. If I want to solve for mass, I would rearrange this equation. You will end up with mass equals Planck's constant divided by wavelength times frequency. So Planck's constant, you know, is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th. And then the wavelength is 4.86 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. And then your velocity is 16,000 meters, kilometers per second, which we need in meters per second. And we had already converted it up above to 16 times 10 to the 6th. Um, which is 1.6 times 10 to the 7th. I guess you could use either one. And then you will end up with a mass of 8.5 times 10 to the negative 35th kilograms. Okay? We're going to skip practice problem number three. Let's go on to the Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and orbital section here. Okay, now, in 1925, there were two competing mathematical theories that tried to explain electron behavior. Heisenberg treated the electron as purely a particle with quantum behavior. And Schrodinger rejected the idea of an electron as a particle, so he viewed it as simply a wave. These two scientists believed that their interpretation was correct, and it became very clear that if you combined their ideas, they were just um, approaching it from different directions and they were going to get the same answer, answer and eventually um, their idea is reunited into one theory. So let's take a look here at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In 1925, Heisenberg identified a fundamental uncertainty associated with measuring any particles. He called it the uncertainty principle. And it is impossible, the uncertainty principle said it is impossible to know exactly both where any particle is located and where it's going at the same time. And the more certain you become of one measurement, the less certain you become of the other. So let's turn the page. Now, the uncertainty principle only matters 
on an atomic scale. So let me explain this a little bit further. Let's go on to seeing and measuring. Now, to locate any particle of matter, you have to illuminate it. Now, light energy is going to bounce off of the objects that you're illuminating. And they're going to be interpreted by our brain or whatever instrument it is that we're looking um, through. A flashlight could locate a baseball. If I throw that baseball into a dark room, when I turn on the flashlight, I immediately know where the ball is and where it's going. When those photons of light energy strike the baseball, there is no measurable effect on that baseball because the baseball has a really large mass. So the light energy is not going to influence where that baseball is going. What if I'm talking about something much smaller? So if we're talking about an electron and I'm trying to see that electron, that's going to require some form of illuminating radiation. But what happens is, whatever I use to light up where that electron is, it's going to bounce off the electron, and because the mass of the electron is so ridiculously small, even one photon of energy hitting that electron is going to blow it away to a completely different location. And so if I'm looking on a quantum level at an infinitely small level, and I'm trying to measure something that's infinitely small, whatever I use to try and measure it is going to cause a significant change in what we're measuring. And so if Heisenberg was right, if I'm trying to find an electron and predict its behavior, it's going to be impossible. So let's move on here to Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's wave equation gives us the probability of finding electrons within a region of space around the nucleus. And these regions that have the highest probability of those electron locations are known as atomic orbitals. And um, there is no evidence that exists that says that electrons are following a particular path around the nucleus. And Bohr's atomic model of a negative particle in a specific orbit has been abandoned at this point. And quantum mechanics is describing electron behavior using math of waves to determine the probability of finding it around the nucleus. In 1932, Heisenberg was awarded the Nobel Prize, and Schrodinger received the honor the following year. So at this point, let's summarize some important aspects of the quantum mechanical view of the atom. Number one, the energies of electrons in atoms are quantized. Number two, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that it is impossible to simultaneously state where an electron is and where it's going. And number three, atomic orbitals are those three-dimensional regions in space that are around the nucleus where the electrons are likely to be found. Let's go on to the quick check here. Number one, how did Heisenberg and Schrodinger see the electron differently? So Heisenberg saw the electron as a pure particle, where Schrodinger saw the electron as a wave. Number two, according to quantum mechanics, how can throwing dice apply to describing electron behavior? Well, we can only describe electron behavior using probability. 
And this is described by Schrodinger's wave equation. Number three, contrast Bohr's electron orbit with the quantum mechanical electron orbital. So Bohr's electron orbit was saying that there was a definite path that electrons follow while circling the nucleus. The quantum mechanical electron orbital is a region around the nucleus where an electron is likely found with specific amounts of energy. 